All right. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. I see people are coming into the room on this evening. It's a pleasure to have you all. Amen. Oh, I love the hearts. And look, those blue hearts match my uh, blouse today. Amen. <laughs> it's a pleasure to have you all to join me uh, this evening as I continue on the teaching that I started on women in ministry. Amen. I uh, pray that um, you are blessed. Play, praise the Lord, Cara. How are you? You say, why are we so fly? You know, I, I, I got to make sure I look decent when I come on here to Periscope. Amen. I try to look decent anyway, but, you know, I just want to be presentable for those that may be tuning in. I don't want you to be distracted by me looking crazy and, you know, things of that nature. So I put on a little makeup, you know, things of that nature. So uh, I'm doing good, Cara. I'm doing good on today. Um, for those of you all that don't know, I'm Tanya Mitchell. Amen. Praise the Lord. Reach higher. Uh, I'm Tanya Mitchell. I'm the pastor of Nothing But The Truth Ministries, uh, located in Clinton, Maryland. I am the founder of the Shepherd Connection Fellowship, amen, which is a fellowship for spiritual leaders. Hey, there's my girl right there. Hey, Overseer Solange. <laughs> Good to have you on. All right. And so... Y'all, tonight we are going to move forward with our teaching on women in ministry. Um, um, if you missed the first part, please go to Catch Me, and that's K-A-T-C-H dot M-E, uh, and just type my name in the search box, Tanya Mitchell. That way you can look at that teaching in its entirety, because I don't want to spend a lot of time dealing with a, a recap of the former scope. So please take an opportunity to do that. And so again, as I said, I'm teaching this uh, 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 subject because it is something that is still of great controversy even today in 2016. Uh, there are some individuals that have no problem with women being in ministry preaching, and there are some individuals that still have a problem with that. Amen. You said that teaching was awesome? Great, great. I pray you enjoy this one tonight as well. And so uh, I am a woman in ministry, have been in ministry for years, uh, um, and I am not doing a teaching like this to try to convince anybody as to why I do what I do. Again, I know who called me, I know who appointed and anointed me, amen? And so because I'm clear with my assignment that came from God, I'm not trying to convince anybody else. So there may be individuals that have a problem with it, but trust me. I'm okay. Amen. And so if you are a woman that's in ministry, I think it's important that you know the historical background of women and where we've come from, even with knowing the history. You know, sometimes I think people think that, you know, when they think about the Bible and, you know, when the Bible was written and the time frame, sometimes I think people think that that was the only, that was all of the world. I mean, the world consists of more than, you know, Israel and the places that we are familiar with that covered the Bible, the biblical times. It was so much more than that. Amen. Uh, that's why the great dispersion was so important because the gospel of Jesus Christ needed to come out of that one area and go into the uttermost parts of the earth. And so you got to understand the Bible uh, and the, uh, uh, the times that it was written and, and who actually wrote it, they were under a particular place. Amen. And so when you understand the history of the Jewish culture, the Hebrew culture, you'll get a greater understanding of why women were so suppressed and how sometimes you can even see it written in the Bible. Um, uh, also, what you got to understand is the word of God. The word of God was written by men inspired by God. It's important to know that God used human vessels to write the word of God that we study each and every day. Now, I'm a female. I minister the word of God. And so guess what? A lot of times you see this happening. If women are not mindful when they minister, you can have a lopsided mindset and every single example or subject matter that you talk about may refer to women. So it's easy for you to say, you know, when you're single, one thing about it, you need to be focusing on God instead of focusing on getting a husband. You know, and so, you know, because you're a woman, you're speaking from a woman's point of view. So you will talk a lot about a lot of things that women can relate to. So as a woman, you have to be mindful of that so that you don't leave the fellas out. I'm only saying that to say when you think about 
40 something men that wrote the Bible, they wrote it from the perspective basically of a man, the way a man actually thinks. All you got to do is read the book of Proverbs. I mean, the book of Proverbs is straight up talking to my son, my son. It's coming against the silly women. It's coming against the immoral woman and things of that nature. So when you even understand that, you can look at the scriptures from a different point of view. Amen. And so, as I said, you know, out of the 40 men that actually wrote the Bible, you have one gentleman, Paul, who wrote the majority of the New Testament. But it's like two of his scriptures, basically two that people always actually use to try to um, talk about different reasons as to why women shouldn't uh, speak and things that nature. So I'll get more into that. Uh, I took us in the history of, of the role of a woman, amen, uh, in Jewish biblical times. And a lot of times when you think about the Jewish leaders and things, of course they had the Torah, they had that that they actually studied from, but they also had uh, a gathering of collections called the Talmud. And in that, it was a lot of different, it was composed of three different sections and they had a section in there that was actually talking about family relationships, marriage and things of that nature. And so in that particular section, it told the man his responsibility Amen. Towards his son. Uh, it talked about his responsibilities towards his wife. You know, the, uh, in the Talmud, it said that the husband was obligated to support his wife, redeem her from captivity if necessary. Uh, and we saw that take place in uh, the situation with Jose and Gomer. Uh, provide her with medicine when she was sick and, you know, uh, provide a funeral when she actually passed away. The wife, on the other hand, according to the Talmud, said that the woman is expected to help in the field if necessary, to help with the flocks when needed, to grind flour, to make bread, cook meals, uh, uh, make and wash the clothes, nurse the children, make the husband's bed, wash his face, hands, and feet. Amen. And, and so today I'm going to be moving forward talking about the education. Because even if you just see the setup, because as I said, the mother, her main responsibility was to teach her daughter how to be a wife and mother. And because females was reared to do just that and nothing else, the woman didn't take on a trade like the son. When the boy became of age, like around five, then he would go out with his father to be uh, trained up and take on a skill and things of that nature, but not the girls. The girls stayed at home. Their whole focus was to be a wife and to be a mother. That's why girls got married as early as 13, 14, and 15 in biblical times. Today, we wouldn't even see that. Let's be for real. We got some women that's 30 and 40 years old. They still ain't ready or prepared to be somebody's wife, even though they think they are. But that's a whole nother subject. But it's more to us than just that. Amen. As women. And so, but when you understand that historical background and the great oppression that came as a result of the Jewish standards, the laws and the things that the rabbis put together in the collection to set the standards, it gives you a better perspective of what we're actually dealing with. So, and, and trust me, with all of this, I'm talking about women in ministry. Um, but let's talk about the education. Because one of the things that I say, I don't care if you are a man or a woman. If you are uneducated on a particular topic, you don't need to be standing before anybody trying to teach them anything. So if a man is uneducated, he don't need to teach. If a woman is uneducated, she doesn't need to teach. But let me explain why it was such a problem for women to teach because women was uneducated. And so, let's talk about education. When you think about education, education, amen. Bless the Lord, uh, uh, lady, uh, uh, Reverend Debbie up there in Baltimore. How you doing? Hey, I know that's right, Bishop Judy. And so, um, let's talk about education. Education is the transfer of knowledge, amen, morals and attitudes from one person to another, Usually from one generation to the next. Oh, thank you. Uh, from one person to the next. And so the pattern for education now is different from biblical times. Today, 
Getting educated is something that everybody has the opportunity to do if their money can afford it. You know, uh, schools are out here. We got public schools that's available for everybody. Do you know in some countries they're still fighting for women to become educated? We don't understand. Here in the United States, we got it going on. But when you think about over there in those places where a lot of the biblical times and with, you know, where people were living during biblical times, that oppression is still there. We don't experience it here. And so the pattern for education uh, now is different from biblical times. Uh, back then, a lot of people were into agriculture, amen, producing crops and, you know, raising livestock. That's how they actually made their living, amen. So, you know, when it comes down to it, yes, the things we take for granted. Um, and so when you think about it, the religious leaders, for the most part, were the only ones that were taught to read and to write. There were a lot of individuals that were uneducated in biblical times, including the men. Amen. And so you had the religious leaders that basically set the standards, exposed the law and things of that nature. So everybody didn't have the ability to even read and write during biblical times. And when it came down to the children, the children were actually homeschooled. Amen. Uh, they were homeschooled. They were instructed in religious instruction. Amen. Uh, big emphasis on religious instruction. That was so important in biblical times. I mean, even for individuals to remember uh, certain things as young kids, it was drilled inside of them to be able to recite stuff. You know, it's so different in today's society. Amen. But when they were home, they were constantly instructed in religious instructions. Amen. Uh, 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 focusing on how of knowing God and knowing how to please him by doing things that were right. Uh, individuals, the children at that particular time, they were trained in practical skills, just practical everyday skills. Yes, people perish for a lack of knowledge, spiritual and secular, definitely. And so during the first five years of a child's life, amen, most of the instruction for that child, be it a girl or a boy, actually came from the mother because the child was with the mom most of the time. And so after the age of five, you had the boys who actually would go out with their dads to work and actually learn a trade. And so in Old Testament times, uh, uh, there were no formal schools. Amen. There was no formal structured curriculum. And so as times move forward in New Testament times, things changed a little bit. Amen. The educational system advanced. Amen. And so you had synagogue schools that began to uh, uh, come about. Amen. They were on the rise during New Testament times. Amen. Especially during the, uh, you know, the period between the Old Testament and the New Testament. There were synagogue schools that were on the rise. Um, then as time went on, when these new structures were put into place and, and, and more individuals could actually come as far as the boys, uh, when it comes down to it, reading and writing was actually taught in these schools on top of the law, on top of the word. Amen. And it was in these particular synagogue schools where the scriptures were actually read, amen. They were actually explained so that those that were there could get a greater understanding of the word of God in a more uh, uh, confined area. Um, and you got to understand, they didn't have the New Testament, amen. They had the Old Testament, amen. And so all of the instruction that they received was basically coming from the law of Moses, and so in the synagogue schools, they was also taught etiquette. You know, we may call it protocol today in our churches, but they were taught uh, etiquette. Uh, they learned a lot about music and the power of worship. Amen. They also was taught about warfare in the synagogue schools. And so when it comes down to the synagogue schools that begin to arise in the New Testament times, who could attend these schools? Not the girls. It was only the boys. Amen. Females were not taught. Amen causing them to remain unlearned in a lot of important areas. Amen. And so the boys, they were able, because remember from birth to five, they was with mama. But from ages six to 12, then they could actually go and attend the synagogue schools. Amen. And unlike our schools that have summer breaks, their schools were in session year round. They didn't have a summer vacation. 
And so now let's talk about the places of worship, because a lot of times when you move and you start dealing with the uh, scriptures that talk about a woman's position and not being able to speak, oftentimes it was in the places of worship where these scriptures were uh, talking about. So let's talk about some places of worship during biblical time. Uh, you had the tabernacle, amen, you had the temples, and you also had the synagogues. And so, God's people, when you think about it, God's people have been gathering together to worship Him, you know, all the way back in Old Testament times, amen? Before the uh, tabernacle was really instructed, they had the tent in the wilderness. People always came together and worship. I don't understand why people always want to come against and say, you know, well, we don't need to go to church and things of that nature. Come on now, to me, the pattern has been set. People have been gathering together, worshiping God collectively throughout the ages, amen, throughout the scriptures in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now we come to this day and age and people want to come up with all these excuses as to why they don't want to go to church or why they think it ain't important. It's important that we assemble ourselves together. So I don't care if you having a meeting in your house because guess what? They had uh, churches in the home. If you in your house, if you've come out of the institutionalized, I'm so sick of the mess that's in the church today, but if you've come out of the institutionalized church and you decide that you're going to have six people that come together and y'all going to study the scriptures in your house, guess what? You still have in church. It's just not in the typical building. But you know, we want to play with words today. Amen. Praise the Lord, warrior Yvette. How you doing? And so, uh, people have been worshiping together for years, for generations. And so you had the tabernacle, amen? When you think about it, the tabernacle was a tent which actually served as a place of worship for the nation of Israel, amen? Uh, um, when you think about it, it consisted of the holies of holies, you know, which contained the Ark of the Covenant. Yes, word games, amen? Uh, but it consisted of the holies of holies, which contained the Ark of the Covenant, you know, and when you think about it, inside it was a copy of the stone tablet. Tablets, the Ten Commandments, amen. The, it was a copy of the Pentateuch that was in there. That's the first five books, amen. A gold pot filled with manna and Aaron's rod, it, uh, but, rod that it butted. Then you also had the holy place, amen. This was the place which contained the altar of incense, golden altar, the seven branch, uh, golden lamp stand, amen, and the table for showbread. Then you had the courtyard, amen, which contained the altar of burnt offering and the levar, which is where you actually cleanse yourself. And so when it comes down to this setup, only assigned people could enter into the tabernacle while others stood on the outside of the tent and looked on. So even then, there were limitations. Everybody couldn't enter in, but yet they were still gathered around. And then as time went on, then you had temples that came about. And a temple was a building in which a god or gods is worship. Amen. It is a place where God manifested his presence. You know, and, and like I said, I'm teaching, so you got to be patient because if you don't understand this foundation, you know, you're going to miss the great understanding that is necessary at this time. And so the first temple uh, uh, for our God, amen, because you had temples that people had erected for other gods, their gods. But the first temple for our God was built under the leadership of King Solomon. And so you had some other ones that was actually built as time went on, you know, Zerubbabel's temple, Herod's temple, things of that nature. And so in the Old Testament, Old Testament temples included places for, guess what, the Israelites. How many of y'all know it included places for the Gentiles, you know, meaning people that weren't Jews because everybody wasn't a Jew, amen. Uh, when you think about it, it also had a place for women, in the temples that began to be erected. It had a place for women, you know, alongside with the regular Holy of Holies, the Holy Place, and the Outer Court. And so the temple often referred to in the New Testament is Herod's temple. Temple, <clears throat> excuse me. And so even though the, one, the women had a court within the temple, guess what? They could join in to, uh, uh, in worship but they were not allowed to participate in the activities. They could not speak. Even though they were allowed to come in, they could not speak. Amen. They could not read the scriptures when they was open and being read. They had limitations. It got to the point. At one point in time, they didn't come. They allowed them to come in. But now that you in, you in here, but don't say nothing. Okay. 
And so they, and you got to understand, they were not required to attend. It wasn't something mandatory for the women to attend. But you had a couple that was like, look, I'm trying to go. I want to see what they're doing over there. Hello? And so they was trying to get prepared for their call and their anointing. But anyway, they weren't required to attend. It was optional. So then now you have the synagogue. Now, the synagogue is a congregation of Jews, amen, for worship and on religious studies. And guess what? Only one could only be erected or formed if there was at least 10 men in the community that was Jewish, amen? And so inside the synagogues, you had different officials. See, now we get into the different roles that people play in the church, but you had different officials that were actually uh, uh, set up and assigned in the synagogues that served in the synagogue. You had your elders in the synagogue, which was a board of devout and respected men, amen, who regulated the policies of the synagogue. Then you had the ruler of the synagogue, amen, who was appointed by the elders. This individual handled matters concerning the building and the planning of the services. Uh, then you had your ministers, amen. And a minister was an individual that had charge over the sacred scrolls, the reading of the word, uh, the word that they would actually read. And so they attended to the lights, the lamps, they kept the building clean. You know, they taught the boys in elementary synagogue school. Amen. The minister, that's what they did. And they also scourged offenders when the time came for it. Then you had the delegate of the congregation which wasn't held by a permanent person, amen, an individual that, it was an individual that was picked before each meeting, amen, to do what? Read the scripture, lead the prayer, to preach, you know, or, or comment on the scripture. Sometimes if you look at what we do in church today, we say, well, that's the person that may have led devotion or things of that nature. They prayed, they uh, read the scripture, different things of that nature. They have one person that did it, but we actually have multiple people that do it. But if you have your Bible and you turn it to Luke chapter 4, you're going to see what I just said to you in action. Luke chapter 4, and I want us to look at verse 16 is where I'm going to start. And so, I just talked to you about the synagogue, the setup, who you had in there, the elders, the rulers, the uh, minister, you know, and the delegation of the congregation, the one that actually uh, basically presided over the service on that particular day. And so, when you look at Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 16, it says, So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, talking about Jesus, amen? And as his custom was... It was something that he was uh, trained to do, amen? As his custom was, he did what? He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath. And he stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet of Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the, at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And after he read the scripture, he did what? It goes on to say, then he closed the book and he gave it back to the attendant, amen, and he sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, the scripture is being fulfilled. Amen. And you're hearing it. So they had the time. They came together. They read the scriptures. He gave the book back. And I'm sure he went on and elaborated. He didn't go into a lot of detail in the scripture as far as what he did. But when you think about it, you have the person that's usually the interpreter in the, in the synagogue. Uh, they translate the scripture, uh, uh, you know, because a lot of times the scripture was actually written in Hebrew in the original language. And so everybody didn't have the Septuagint at that particular time. That's the Old Testament that's actually translated into the Greek. And then you had individuals that dealt with the money. So now, be mindful of this fact that I'm going to share. Women were not educated. Amen. Women were not required to go to the temples or the synagogues. Women could listen only, amen, for a long time. They could only listen. 
uh, but they could not speak if they attended worship. Uh, the women were inferior to men. It's a given. You can't get around it. They were inferior to men. And guess what? They were actually separated from the men when they attended the worship. Because remember, bless the Lord. Oh, amen. Working down and can stay only, only for a few. All right, uh, Tracy. And so um, they were separated, you know, from the men, even though they attended the worship. And so this particular lifestyle was engrafted in the hearts of the people for generations and generations, including Paul. Amen. And so when you think about it, Jesus Christ, when he came on the scene, he began to change the way of doing things. Amen. He began to change the tone of how people will actually begin to interact with women. Turn your Bibles to John chapter four, because you can see it clearly here in this scripture. Because, you know, here it is, you got Jesus interacting with a woman. But not only was she a woman, she was a Gentile woman. Amen. And so Jesus interacted and he conversated with women, Jews and Gentiles. John chapter 4, let's look at verse 5 and through 9. And the word of God says, So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of the ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus therefore being weary from his journey sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water from Jesus. You know, came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. So he was there. They wasn't with him. He spoke to the woman and said, you know, give me a drink. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you... Amen. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but he said, how, the woman said, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? Because, you know, the Jews were the chosen people. You know, the Jews, you know, didn't want to interact with others that were, you know, outside of their culture, or their race. Amen. And you got to understand, you are a Gentile. A Gentile is anybody that is not a Jew. Amen. And so, you know, she knows the setup. She knows historical history. She knows that Jews don't interact with people like us. And she's saying, how in the world is it that you are going to ask me for a drink? Amen. If you go over to verse 27, because I skipped over the conversation that she had when he revealed her issues and all that. But then you have verse 27. And it says, at this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he was, he had talked with a woman. Do y'all see that? They was tripping. His disciples, who had went away to get some food, they came back and they marveled that he talked to a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking to her? They ain't questioning him. They didn't come out their mouth and say, Jesus, hold up. What's up with you? Why are you talking to this woman? But trust me, they had some thoughts going on in their mind because they knew what was considered to be acceptable and not acceptable. And so you got to understand, Jesus was changing things. Jesus welcomed women, amen, as travel companions with him. So not only did he have males that actually were following him now, he had women that were actually following him as well uh, while he was here. Uh, he encouraged women like Mary and Martha to come sit at his feet, you know, to receive the word that he was shared, not just with the fellas, but also with them. And so Jesus Christ had a respect for women that the average man did not have in biblical times. And so it was new and it was hard for many people to accept it. And so this freedom that women begin to experience, amen, when Jesus came on the scene, first of all, it was the freedom from segregation. We don't have to follow from afar. We can be right here, amen. Uh, it was the freedom of really being able to talk and in, be interact when the world was going forward, amen. Because, you know, Jesus was one that would interact with the people. Uh, openly being able to participate, you know, when gathered. You said newsflash, the women were faithful then and still faithful and they didn't have a voice. Come on now. That speaks volumes. That's right. Because even when we did not have a voice, we were still faithful. 
and we're still faithful now. Amen. But it changed. Times changed. No longer did they have to be in the court that was set up for the women. But even when you look at the day of Pentecost, when Jesus told the disciples to go and to wait until the Holy Spirit come upon you. Do y'all think he was talking about the 12? Do you think uh, that it was only men? If that's what you think, then you don't know your word. Because when you think about the individuals that was gathered together in the upper room, amen, it was 120 men and women, amen, that were there waiting for the promise of the Holy Spirit. It was, again, men and and women gathered together in the upper room waiting for the promise of the Holy Spirit. And so the freedom that women began to experience was very new. Amen. And it caused some problems, you know, within the church. And even when I think about this woman at the well, it was because of her running and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ that others came to know Christ. Amen. She had an encounter with Jesus. She opened up her mouth, ran, and told everybody. And there was individuals that wanted to see who this Jesus was based on what came out of her mouth. And then once they came in contact, many believed because of her testimony. But then there was others that came and they believed because they had contact themselves. But she opened her mouth and proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ. And so, you know, when you can't think about it, it was new. There were some individuals that still had problems within the church, you know. So Paul gave some of the early congregations some guidelines, amen, uh, that still limited the role of women. And so also, one, you cannot overlook the fact that some traditions are hard to change. Here it is, 2016, you have some individuals that will go to their grave still not accepting that women have the ability to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some people are stuck. Some people are not going to change. Tradition has said it's like this. We're never going to change it. Our religious background says this. Guess what? Don't sweat it. Don't allow it to upset you. Because some things are not going to change. Amen. And so, you think about it. The word of God said in Joel 28 that he was going to pour out his spirit on all flesh. You know, men, old men, young women, the whole nine yards. And so the Holy Spirit isn't limited to just one particular individual. And when the anointing and the spirit of God comes on you, there were things that will be able to come out of you. Amen. And so... Let's talk about it. Again, remember, women was considered as inferior. We cannot ignore that fact. We got to realize that the Bible was written by men. You know, most of it coming from a man's point of view because it was men that was actually writing it. Women were uneducated. They couldn't go to school. And so they were unlearned. They didn't. How could they explain the scriptures? Amen. If they did not understand it. Uh, and so, you know, women, again, if they attended the temples or the synagogue, they were separated from the men for a while. Now. I said it before and I'll say it again. If you know that somebody is unlearned in any subject to teach you, you know, about a particular subject, would you want them to instruct you? And the answer would be basically no. And so, again, the book was written. And in the book, it wrote about the good, the bad, and the ugly. It talks about love. It talks about adultery. It talks about murder. It talks about everything in the word of God. Amen. Again, it was written from a male perspective. Uh, look at Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. You'll see again how I'm telling you that it was written from a male perspective. Proverbs chapter 1. I'm just going to read verse 1 and verse 8. But it says, the proverb of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. Uh, 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 that's who actually wrote it, uh, Solomon. Amen. When you go down to verse 8, uh, verse 8, it says, my son. Hear the instruction of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother. When you go to Proverbs chapter 6, verse 20, you know, the word of God says in uh, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 20. Again, it says, my son, keep your father's commands and do not forsake the law of your mother. Throughout, it's constantly warning the guys about what type of women not to mess with and different things of that nature. And so... The Bible was written by men, and oftentimes they wrote it inspired by God, but according to their customs and their culture. Amen? And so you got to remember, the Talmud played a major role in the lives of Jewish people. And there was a lot of limitations in that book when it comes down to women. And so in the midst 
of their God inspired writings, you know, that they gave us, you got to understand that sometimes they gave their opinion. Now understand this, Paul was clear in this, amen. And when you think about an opinion, an opinion is a view, a judgment or appraisal formed in the mind about a particular matter. Come on, y'all. I, I got to show you a scripture so you don't think I'm tripping. Because y'all say, well, you know, God gave it to them. How are they going to write their opinion? You'll see. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is a prime example where you will see Paul, the one who the controversy is around. Paul is the individual that wrote in the scripture. And guess what? They, he gave his opinion. In, Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8 and 9, the word of God says, but I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. See, one thing about it, the Bible, God doesn't command that a person stays single, but that was Paul's opinion. And so he said, but I say to the unmarried. When you go down to it, look at verse 10. It's very key. It says, now to the married I command. Then he clears it up. Yet not I, but the Lord. A wife is not to depart. And it goes on and on. But look at verse 12. Now he can give his opinion. He said, but to the rest, I, not the Lord, say, if any brother has a wife who does not believe, and it goes on and on. So here in that particular passage of scripture, you will see two places where Paul, a, a man that was inspired by God, in the midst of the writing, he gave his opinion. His opinion was, stay single. His opinion was, I say it, not the Lord, and he made that perfectly clear. And so when you think about it, let's go and now look at 1 Timothy just briefly. 1 Timothy chapter 2 where it talks about men and women in the church. Okay? So Paul wrote this book. And we talked about they, how he gave his opinion. How some people inserted their opinion. When you look at Paul chapter, I mean 1 Timothy chapter 2. Let us talk about, go down to verse 9. It says, in like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel. With propriety and moderation. Not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly uh, uh, clothing, but which I, mm, excuse me, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Verse 11, let a woman learn in silence with all submission. Key verse number 12. And I, he's speaking, Paul is saying, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over man, but to be in silence. He clearly said, I, it wasn't that it said the Lord said God commands that a woman is not able to do this. It says, I, he's talking to Timothy. He's giving Timothy some instructions because Timothy is a new pastor. And a lot of times when you have a pastor that is actually mentoring you, they will give you some advice as to how you should actually, you know, start out, do ministry and things of that nature. So they're going to tell you things from some of their experience. But he told Timothy, he said, let me tell you, I I don't permit a woman. And so it wasn't that he said God said, but he said, I don't permit. And so in the beginning, when God created Adam and Eve as husband and wife, remember, he didn't give them authority over one another. Amen. However, as life progressed, because he is a man of decency and order, you know, he established different types of authority for the world system. And so, when you are dealing with groups of people, there has to be order. So, you know, the husband is the head of the wife. You know, Jesus is the head of the uh, of the husband. And, you know, you know, the husband is the head of the wife. There has to be order. You have pastors that are set up and established in churches. And they are the uh, authority figures over the congregation. And so, when you think about the term authority, it means power to influence or command a thought, opinion, or behavior. It also means persons in command. And so, people with authority, right with me, people with authority usually lead others. Now, if you go back in biblical times, in the Old Testament, the children of Israel, guess what? 
the children of Israel needed to be guided. So the Lord sent leaders before them. Amen. And how many of y'all know one of those leaders was a woman? You may not believe what I'm telling you. So if you was to look in your Bible in Micah chapter 6, verse 4. I'm reading this one from the new NIV version. Amen. I got two different versions here. But it says, I brought you out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam. That same version, that same scripture, another verse says, I, this is God speaking, I rescued you from Egypt when you were slaves. I sent Moses, Aaron, and Miriam to be your leaders. They together were the leaders over the congregation of Israel. We know that Moses was the head leader, if you want to think about spiritual hierarchy. But the scriptures clearly tell us that the leaders that were sent, it was Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. The last time I checked, Miriam was a woman, right? Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Is Miriam a woman? And was she called to be one of the leaders over the people? And the people consisted of men and women? Okay. I'm just saying. So anyway, when you think about it, you have different women that, that from the Old Testament that had prominent positions. Remember, they were limited. You didn't have a lot of women that did a lot of things in the Old Testament, but you had some. First of all, Miriam was an example of one. She was the sister of Moses and Aaron. Amen. She was a prophetess. Amen. Then you think about a whole woman. <laughs> Hello. And then you have Deborah. We know about Deborah. Deborah was a judge, amen? That was a position of leadership and authority, amen? And she ruled in her position for 40 years. She was the only female judge. There was a lot of judges, but she was the only female judge. So there was some, but it wasn't a lot, amen? And guess what? She was a prophetess as well, amen? And a wife. Then how many of y'all know... Yes, indeed. And she worked it. How many of you know you had Hulda? Amen. You know, and she was another prominent woman in the Old Testament. She was a prophetess. Amen. And so when the book of the law had been found and the king needed to know the understanding of the word for himself and for the people and all of Judah, guess what? He sent and got a woman. To come to him and interpret the word of God to him so that he could get understanding. Now you may ask yourself, were there other any prophets at this time? Yes, because during this same exact time, Jeremiah was a prophet. But guess what? Jeremiah wasn't the one that was used to come and explain the word of God. Amen. It was Hulda. Hilda. I'm probably saying it wrong. But she was a woman. Amen. She was an authoritative agent for the transmission of God's word. And so you had Miriam, Deborah, and Hilda, who were just a few women in the Old Testament times. And of course, like I said, if you had more men that were actually used, but God can use women as well. And so we have to realize we cannot put God in a box. He will use whoever he chooses to use. Amen. Because he wants his message to be understood. He wants his message to get out. And so if there is an, a, a willing vessel that he is equipped. Whew. Everybody don't have the assignment to declare the word of the Lord on certain levels. You have the fivefold ministry that was put in position. But guess what? God is the one that created all of us. He put certain gifts inside certain people. And he did not limit certain giftings to the male species only. He put it inside people. And so guess what? If you're apostle, prophet, pastor, evangelist, or teacher, then guess what? You have an assignment to declare the word of the Lord, whether you're male or a female. And when you have that assignment, you're going to declare it to all people, males and females, young and old, boys and girls. And so God can do what he wants. Amen. Just think about it for a second. 
Early on, men have been taught to reject the word from a woman. And so we're still looking at this mindset and how even the New Testament times trying to get away from it. You got to understand how the Jewish culture was taught. They was taught to reject the word from a woman. Jesus Christ is the word. Amen. And when you think about it, the word who is Jesus Christ came through the womb of what? A woman. But the Jewish culture for woman for women has always been twisted. In that Talmud and certain things that was drilled into the minds of the Jewish people, especially the Jewish men, guess what? They used to say things like the testimony of 100 women is not equal to that of one man. If that is how a generation of people are trained to think, then the very words of a woman will have no effect on them. Because listen to that. The testimony of 100 women is not equal to that of one man. Whatever. Because as we already saw, that one woman who was at the well, she ran and told many. There was another saying that was very popular. That was said, it is a shame for a woman to let her voice be heard among among men. So again, if you have been raised in the Jewish culture and in the traditions, we know that Paul had the Jewish uh, culture and the Roman citizen, but guess what? He was steeped in that Jewish stuff. He was a Sadducee. I mean, he was a Pharisee, y'all. Come on now. At one point in time, he was trained in that. So when you think about that type of thinking being instilled in him, the mind had to be renewed. And so if it was a shame for a woman's voice to be heard among men, why you think it was important for them to be silent in the church? Because the mindset was, it's a shame for their voice to be heard. So if we allow you into the temple, the last thing we want to do is hear anything that you have to say. Because in the Talmud, it says it is a shame for a woman to let her voice be heard among men. That's why she was instructed, no, you don't talk up in here. You go home and you talk to your husband. But again, that was because of the inferior complex that was on women Coming from men in the Jewish culture. So guess what? Jesus' disciples had to be delivered from their mindsets of women. As well as Paul and many others and people even today. Paul was an individual that wrote the majority of the New Testament. Amen. He was a Roman citizen. However, he, his, he came from a Jewish heritage. Amen. And that was more prominent in his life than anything. And as I said, he was a Pharisee. He was steeped, amen. He was very well educated, but he was steeped in the Jewish laws and traditions. And how many of y'all know, every time you turned around, Jesus always rebuked the Pharisees for their traditions. Because it says, it is your traditions that make the word of God of none effect. And so when Paul was converted to be a follower of God, his thinking really had to change, amen? It really had to be renewed, and so that is even a process. And so the teachings of Jesus Christ was exposing, amen, the weakness of the Jewish laws. Oh yeah, the more Jesus began to teach, the more Jesus began to deal with people, males and females, Jews and Gentiles, oh, it was breaking down all the tradition and the Jewish laws that had been set up and established and that the people was actually steeped in. And so when you think about it, Paul, he learned that his ways prior to conversion was wrong. And so God called him as a person not only to minister the gospel, but to minister it to people that wasn't even Jews. He had an assignment, amen, to the Gentiles, you know. And so when you have been reared a certain way for the majority of your life. Then guess what? It's not easy to change. It's not easy to let stuff go. Because it has been instilled in you. And every now and then, some of those ways come out of you, even though you know your life has changed. Amen. Even though you know your thinking has changed and progressed. 
And so in some of Paul's writings, amen, you can hear some of the old man in him, some of that Jewish tradition coming out of him. But don't doubt in your mind for a minute that he did not understand the spirit of God. Amen. He didn't don't think that he didn't understand what Christ actually did. You got to understand, prior to Christ, Paul, along with other young men, used to repeat words, amen, on a consistent basis, such as, oh God, I thank you, I am neither a Gentile, nor a slave, nor a woman. Okay, this was something that they constantly repeated. They constantly drilled into their spirit. But then you think about it, the same individual that struggled, Paul, he knows the truth because he turned around and he wrote Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 and 28 that actually says, and I'm going to read it to you. He wrote it and he says, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. See, Paul understood. There were some things that Paul was addressing in certain places. And you have to understand that. Even when I think about the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church had so many things that was out of order that the whole part of Corinthian, the book of Corinthian was checking the stuff. The gifts was out of control. You know, people was just out of control and Paul had to check them. So even when he dealt with the women, you probably had a lot of women that was excited about their newfound freedom and they ready to just go on and on and share some stuff. But yet they were still ignorant. You know, and so the thing is, because if you know Paul and his relationship with people, he had a lot of women that he dealt with. You think about Priscilla and Aquila. This was a couple that ministered the word of God. They had a church in their home. There's different individuals that Paul talked about in the scriptures. Amen. So if you understand his relationship with different women throughout the scriptures, that was for a group of women. It wasn't a universal word. Amen for everybody. And then again, like I said, you also got to remember the mindset because he said, I don't. It's not that he was, you know, he just said he don't. He told Timothy, I don't. And so the bottom line is we have to understand that God can use whoever he wants to use. Amen. You think about Phoebe. Phoebe is a woman. She was a leader in the body of Christ. Amen. In the Bible and in Romans, it talks about her. You know, the word servant there is Greek for the word diakony. And that's for a deaconess. Amen. She was a female and she was a deacon. And so when you really do your study, you'll see that women have been used in the Bible from the Old Testament up to the New Testament. And God is still using them. And so I can't wait. I'm, going, I'm getting ready to end this, but I can't wait to go even deeper. Because like I said, this is one of those teachings where I can't do it all in one particular sitting. But even when you look at the scripture in Ephesians chapter 4, when it uh, talks about how he gave some to be apostles. You know, you know, when you go to that particular scripture, let me turn there and I'm going to end with this. Uh, I'm going to end with this, uh, blah, blah, Ephesians chapter 4. You know, because remember, I laid the foundation and I told you all, I said, if you don't understand the, the original uh, language, you will be so confused just reading it. And that's why I had to show you where you can have the one word man, M-A-N, used in two different places. And one time it could be referring to mankind. Another time it could re be referring to the male. Guess what? Ephesians chapter 4 uh, it goes on to verse 7, it says, and I'm just going to read the part, it says, When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts to men. See, this is the a passage of scripture that's talking about the gifts that he gave to men. It's talking about the apostle, the prophet, the pastor, the teacher, and the evangelist. Well, if you read that, and you say, well, it said he gave gifts to men, you may automatically think that it's talking about a male. But when you go back and you look up the original language, and it means anthropos, amen, 444 is the number in the Strong's Concordance. Guess what? It's talking about human beings. So God gave gifts to human beings. He gave the gift of apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, and evangelist to human beings. It's not talking about just the male species. But again, some things you will never know unless you do a deep study on it. And like I said, I've done a deep study on it. There's so much more that I'm going to talk about, but I needed to know this for me. 
Amen. Even when I teach it to my church, one of the things I said, it's not that you have to prove to anybody why you sit under a female pastor. The bottom line is you need to have an understanding. So when you go back in history, when you look at how women were suppressed and they were inferior, they was uneducated, they was trained just to be homebodies and be the wife and have babies and train the girls to do the rest. When you understand that mindset, you see the bondage. But we have come a long way. And God is using whoever he wants to in the body of Christ. Most people would say, well, hey, he used the donkey. Why can't he use a woman? You know, but it's deeper than that. And so sometimes you got to go deep into the word to get a greater understanding of that. Amen. And so I'm going to stop there. Amen. Because I know if you continue to go on and on and on, you actually lose people. People can only retain but so much. But I pray again that you were able to receive from yet again this foundational teaching on this subject matter, women in ministry. Amen. You said, thank you, Pastor Tanya, for the teaching and the knowledge. Thank, uh, amen. You're welcome. You're welcome. I pray that you are blessed. Uh, again, if anybody is tuned in and they missed the first part of this teaching, please go to catch me. Thank you, Overseer Solange. I'm so glad that you all are being blessed by it. Amen. Uh, um, you know, and when I put it out there on Facebook last week, I said, this ain't meat. I mean, this isn't a milk teaching. So if a person wants milk teaching, this ain't, this ain't milk. This will bore somebody. Can I just be honest? Amen. You say you was blessed, but trust me, if a person is still a babe in Christ and they just, you know, some people just give me the answer right now and I need to know about women and men. Give it to me. Break down the scripture. This will bore them. But when you get this foundation, you got a greater understanding of why the struggle is there. Why people had an issue with it. Why some people still have an issue with it. And we can't overlook, for real, the oppression that was there. And is still prevalent in some places today. We got a lot of freedom here in the United States. But with, 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 with over in Israel and things of that age, they still have great oppression. Because they're still deep-rooted in Jew, Jewish traditions that came against women being anything but a mother and wife. And so on that note, if you want to know more about my ministry, you can look on my profile here. Uh, it has my website, www.tanyamitchellministries.com. Uh, feel free to go to my website, learn more about it, learn about the Shepherd Connection, learn about me. I have products on there, amen. You can get my book, uh, Why Do I Keep Falling, on my website. Um, I have CDs on there. If you just decide, hey, I would like to sow a seed into your ministry, guess what? There's a link on the website for that too. But I pray that you have been blessed. And again... If you miss the first part, go to www.catchme.com. No, www.catchme, K-A-T-C-H dot me. All right, you all have a wonderful evening. Be blessed.